Good evening, Mr. Madison. Oh, Emil. How are you tonight? Very fine, thank you. Now, I hope Armando's been able to change our reservation. We called a little earlier. Oh, yes. Your table is all ready. Good. Right this way, please. Oh. In fact, Mrs. Madison is already here. Mrs. Madison? Oh, darling. And Deborah, how lovely you look. Nola, what is this? This, darling, is a table for three. Please, sit down. Oh, and what's going on here? I don't know. I certainly didn't arrange it. Uh, no, darling, I did. I thought it was time for the three of us to sit down and talk about things. Uh, that sounds like something out of one of your old movies. Only you forgot to add, uh, like, civilized people. Nothing wrong in being civilized, is there? Or being honest? Oh, look, if you want to talk, we'll talk, but not in a public place, for God's sake. But we may never have another chance like this, darling. Deborah, please, don't you agree? But it's time to decide which one of us this man really wants. I don't know how this happened, but I am not in the mood for playing games tonight, Mrs. Madison. I'm surprised you are, considering what's happened. Oh, you mean about Eddie? You think I should be home in mourning? I think you should be home resting. No, you've had a bad experience. You could have died in that fire yourself, you know. Yes, and wouldn't that have solved this little triangle? Oh, and I can't take this anymore. Don't you think you owe me a few minutes of your time? Oh, I, I know, of course, you're, you're outraged at the moment, aren't you? Because I've intruded on your little rendezvous. But believe me, this isn't the first one I've attended. The only difference is you haven't seen me. Meaning you've been spying on us? Yes, well, I hope that gives you pleasure, darling. So you can feel that you were the one who was being wrong, not me. But deep down, you know very well what the truth is. That you're the offender. A cheap little husband stealing the tramp. Oh, and I'm sorry. Deborah. Yes, sir. May I get you something from the bar? No, thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, well, looks like you're not going to have your little three-way conversation, so why don't you just go ahead and say what you have to say to me, right? Is there anything left to say? Oh, I think so. I think so, yes. First of all, you can tell me how you knew about this dinner. What have you been doing, listening in on my telephone conversations? I heard you making the reservation. I called the restaurant back and made it for three. <sighs> Nola, I have tried to be honest with you. Now, I told you about Deborah. I told you that I was seeing her. What did you expect me to do? Tell you every single time we met? No, no, no. That would have been awkward for you, wouldn't it? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I don't know how to behave myself. I don't know what lines. Look, but what I do know is this is my fault. What's happened? I All didn't of it. say it was. But it's Nola. true. I've been a, such a poor excuse for a wife. Oh, and I hate the woman I've been. I hate her. I don't blame you for hating her, too. But don't you think it's possible? I've, I've changed. Oh. Look at me. Oh, and I am different. Can't you see it? We have Eddie to thank for that. Poor Eddie. He forced me to change. He made me work again, and it's brought back my self-respect. Has it really? Tell me, Nola, is it your self-respect that made you do this? No, this was desperation. Because I am desperate. Desperate to save the, the most important thing in my life, my marriage. Oh, and please, give me the chance to do that. Just one more chance. Don't you think it's strange of Uncle Eddie's lawyer to fly all the way out here from the coast? I guess there are just some things that have to be decided. Important things, like uh, where Uncle Eddie would have preferred to be buried. Uh, you know, if it turns out that Eddie requested burial in California, Dad and I might just find ourselves accompanying the coffin out to the West Coast. Brian, please, don't say that. I'm sorry, Paige. I'm even sorrier that you won't be accompanying us out there. 
Why? What difference would it make, really? You wouldn't see me anyway, would you? Of course I would. Yeah, family reunions. Sure, anytime. But you don't mean that, Brian. You'll be so relieved to be on that plane heading west. You'll be so happy to be in California. When I'm here, 2,000 miles away from you, far enough away to, to be forgotten. No, Paige. I'll never forget you. You don't mean that. Because, because you've told me a dozen times that you can't remember me the way that I want to be remembered, Brian. Paige, it isn't always easy to control your thoughts. I know that. I've told you what my thoughts were. I was willing to behave in a way that most people would be find revolting, but I was willing. And now? Your unwillingness changed my mind. And so, um, the offer is withdrawn. I don't joke about it, Brian. I'm sorry, Paige. I, I don't mean to joke. I don't find it very funny. In fact, I think it's just about the most unfunny thing that's ever happened to two people. What? What's happened to us? Then we've um, made the right decision, both of us. You go to California and I'll stay here. That way, the only thing that'll be between us is an occasional postcard and a, uh, a telephone call, long distance, but just to say hello. Paige, no, Paige. <sighs> Paige, the hard part is is going to be saying goodbye without really saying goodbye. I guess it can't be avoided. No. Uh, it goes with the territory, as they say. Maybe when you go to the airport with Daddy and you're ready to leave for California, maybe we should just say goodbye for good. Going out. Yeah, well, that's just what it looks like, Chief. I mean, this guy, Eddie Vaughn, was playing all sorts of tricks on the soundstage of that movie and just for publicity. Hmm. Did he kill himself just for publicity? Well, uh, I don't think he would have had an encore. Save the jokes for the coffee break, okay? Well, what I mean is, uh, I don't think he meant to kill himself in the fire. Although there's little question that uh, he did start it himself. You have got a positive witness who saw him with the gasoline can. Absolutely. Owen Madison's son, Brian, saw him take the can out of the family garage and put it in the trunk of his car. Although, at the time, nobody knew what he intended to do with it. We're still dealing with an arson case, Deputy. You gotta remember that. Arson with intent to defraud uh, the insurance I, company. I just don't think that's what Mr. Vaughn had in mind. But you don't know that. Well, no, not for sure, but uh, Detective Saxon can verify that absolutely all of the strange things that happened on that soundstage were done deliberately. I mean, the guy had all sorts of tricks rigged. Uh, slide projectors and uh, dummy ghosts and lights rigged to fall on cue. And this was going to be his last big stunt, is that it? All right, I suppose we have enough problems around here without trying to prosecute a dead man. Well, that's the way I figure it. So, uh, case closed? Unless the local authorities want to do something about it. But as far as I'm concerned, file it, Deputy. Right. Uh, Chief Mallory, I would like to, uh, speak to you about this deputy business. What about it? Well, uh, of course you know that, uh, Chief Marceau made the appointment before he left. I, uh, just don't want you to feel stuck with his decision. I mean, I won't take it personally if you decide to bust me back to the line. But you're back in the line now. I thought that's what you wanted. But I've still got this title. Look, I, I, if you should decide you want to name somebody else to the job, it'll be all right with me. I'll think about it, okay. All right. Oh, 
Oh yeah, you uh, told me to remind you about that uh, that murder suspect, uh, Earl Stokes, the one that Deborah had the APB put out on. Is he located? Yeah, they brought him in about half an hour ago. Saxon going to interrogate him? Yes, but she's not due in till ten. Well, let me know when she gets here. I think I may sit in on that one. I'm very interested in the way Saxon handles her cases. I don't think she's been on top of them lately. Look, Chief, it's just that Deborah's just had a couple of personal problems. That's all. Oh, well, I've had a few problems myself. Yeah, this hangnail's been bothering me for a week. I'll, uh, see you later. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Are you kind of early? Yeah, I decided to give the department a couple of hour free. You look pretty. How come you dressed up? Oh, I was at a little party. It turned out so nice. Uh... Listen, did you uh, get any word from TCR on Earl Stokes? Oh, yeah, good news. He's in interrogation room B. Wait, don't you want the file? Hey, Saxon, do you want to see me about something? Oh, boy, you, I swear you turn up everywhere, don't you? All right. I'm going to get it back at the Super Bowl. Well, you're going to keep me company, cute stuff? I'm Detective Saxon. You can forget the cute stuff. Detective? No kidding. You know, I've always wanted to be pinched by a lady cop and vice versa. Look, I think you know why you're here, Stokes. Marsha Blaine was your mistress for the past two years. And according to at least half a dozen witnesses. And there is no way that she could have fired the gun that killed her. What's the matter, Detective? Your hand is shaking. Look, Stokes, you can uh, make this very easy for both of us. Just answer the question. And you look right? like you've been crying. What's the matter, honey? Listen, Stokes. I figured this is where it was. The way that dress fits, cutie, it couldn't be anywhere else. Hey, Stokes, listen. Do you know where you are? You, think you are I want... in police headquarters. You think I want to be here? Just answer the questions the right way. You can be out of here. Oh, don't kid me, Foxy lady. You got a little cage waiting for me downstairs. I've been there before. Look, you are going to go right back there if you don't give me back my gun. Look, I'm leaving without answering any more questions. You're getting me out of here right now. Well, you're crazy. You're not going to get halfway down the corridor. Well, then neither will you. You think I give a damn about squeezing another trigger? You know I killed Marsha. The whole damn building knows it. I only wish that you were her so I could kill her again. But come on, get on your all horse. Right, all right, all right. Just listen to me. There are at least half a dozen armed guards out there. All right. We'll play it the smart way. You're, you'll tell them you're taking me downstairs to get me booked. Only we'll take the elevator to the second floor basement, not the first. Been to the here garage. Before, huh? That's right. And then you're going to drive me out of town, sweet, sweet thing. After that, we'll see. Come on, open the door. All right, all right, all right. Well, I'm going to sit in on this one, Saxon. Chief, uh, I'm taking the prisoner down to be booked. How come? I was told you just arrived. Not for murder, for possession. He's got my gun. Ow! Oh! Oh! Greg! Oh! Greg! Get it. Oh, you're choking me! You're choking Get me! Get out of my sight. Do it! Do it! So. All right, what happened? Well, I was a little careless. I left my purse on the desk and, and uh, he grabbed And he it just took your weapon away from you. Yeah, I made a mistake. He looked like he was ready to use that gun. Well, I think he would have, too. If it... Well, at least he admitted that he killed Marsha Blaine and uh, we can book him for murder. On that. Detective. Detective! If he had taken you hostage, not only might you have been killed, but other officers as well. You realize that, don't you? Yes, I realize that. I... I already admitted that I made a mistake. What else do you want me to do? Came here an hour ahead of schedule. You look like you're dressed for a party. What's the matter? Wasn't the party any fun? Is that what your problem is? Is that why you can't keep your mind on your duty? Maybe it was. I don't know. I think you're going to wish you stayed at that party tonight. Look at 
refuse a drink. So did I. But I won't have one. There may not be much you can give me credit for, but that at least. Oh, I give you credit for that, no. So what's this? A letter from Brian. Dear Mom and Dad, I've hit the sack early. Paige has gone to a movie. Eddie's lawyer calls. She'll be arriving here this evening. She? Well, isn't that interesting? Huh. Did you know Eddie's attorney was a woman? No, I didn't. Well, man or woman, I'm glad that she's coming here. I want to get this thing settled once and for all. Yes. Such a good feeling, isn't it? To have things settled. We have something to settle ourselves on, don't we? Yes, we do. Oh, and this picture we just finished. I don't know if it'll be a success or a failure, but we, we did finish it, didn't we? Together. Yes. yes. It was a second chance for us. For both of us. And that's what our marriage needs, too. A second chance. Look, it, it oh. may not work. I don't know if it'll be box office, but, but don't you think we owe ourselves the chance to try? No, it's too late. But it wasn't too late for the movie. It might not be too late for the marriage. But when we go back to Hollywood, when, we, when we're together again and the way we were, it, it might all come together again. Oh, no. well, can't we at least try? Owen. All right. We can try. Oh, well, that sounds like Ms. Ackerman is here. Oh, Owen, darling. Excuse me. There's a Mrs. Ackerman to see. Finally, would you just show her in, please? Yes, Thank sir. You. you come in. Thank you. Well, Hello, I'm Lila Ackerman. Pleasure to meet you. Uh, Mrs. Ackerman, my wife, uh, Nolan. Yes, of course. I know your face very well, Mrs. Madison. It's a little the worse for wear right now. Yes, of course, I understand. Eddie was a very lovable man. We'll all miss him. Yes. Yes. Oh. Please, sit down. It was very thoughtful of you to come out all this way. <clears throat> really, above and beyond the call of duty. I'm rather anxious to find out if Le Eddie left any uh, instructions for burial. Of course, knowing Eddie the way we do, I'm sure he thought he'd live forever. <laughs> Don't we all? Well, I can relieve your mind on that point. Eddie did express a preference in his will. Huh. Perhaps you'd like to hear it. Well, uh, sure, if it's proper. Oh, yes, it's proper. Especially as he made some bequests to you and to your wife. Eddie did? I'm surprised. I didn't think he had anything to leave. Well, he didn't have very much, I'm afraid. However, his ex-wife will be receiving a lump sum settlement on her alimony payments because of a small insurance policy that Eddie carried. Other than that, well, shall I read it? Please, go ahead. It's very brief and very impersonal, just like Eddie. I... Edward Stanton Vaughan. Being of sound mind and body, although I sure get tired around five o'clock, do hereby bequeath the following. To my ex-wives, love and kisses. To my good friend Owen Madison, my collection of movie scrapbooks, for whatever they're worth. To his wife, Nola, who should have been smart enough to marry me, the diamond ring in the pocket of my blue worsted suit hanging in the closet of my bedroom. The suit doesn't fit anymore, and the ring never did, since I never had the nerve to give it to her. Oh, Betty. The rest of my legacy, consisting of about 15,000 bucks in the National Bank of California, stocks and bonds valued at about 30,000, if the market hasn't gone to hell in a handbasket by the time I'm gone, and a tennis racket given to me by Pancho Gonzalez, and anything else he wants in the house, I leave to my son. Son? Is that what you said? Yes. No, 
Well, there's got to be a mistake. Now, Eddie didn't have any children. Apparently he did. No, no, that's impossible. Well, he, he did have four wives on. Darling, he may have, but he didn't have any children by them. Now, I know that for a fact. Unless, of course, he strayed from the pasture. Well, is, is that what he meant, Mrs. Sackman? I really can't say. If you're his attorney. Surely you must know to whom he's referring. Well, I didn't know, not when the will was prepared. I didn't know Eddie as well as you did, but I was rather surprised myself by the bequest. Well, maybe he meant it figuratively. That's possible, of course. The will was not the only document that Eddie left. There was also a letter, a sealed letter. He gave instructions to us that it wasn't to be opened until after his death. To whom was it addressed? To his son, Mr. Madison. Here it is. Perhaps it will explain everything. I don't know, Mrs. Ackerman. It seems to me that you know a lot more than you're letting on. Well, the truth is my husband knew and he told me. That's why I thought I should come here in person and deliver the papers to you. It seemed very impersonal to simply mail them to you or tell you the contents over the telephone. Mrs. Ackerman, what is this all about? Perhaps you should look at this. Oh, and what, what does it say? It says, to my son, Brian. Nicole Drake. Stay tuned now for the six o'clock news when we'll be bringing you a report on the power failure in Center City, the resignation of City Council President Collins, and also the story of a tragic fire in Glenboro that took the life of Hollywood publicist Eddie Vaughn and destroyed the set of Mansion of the Damned. Oh, don't you want to see it? I'm not sure I do. I still can't believe Uncle Eddie is really... Maybe... Seeing it on TV will make it seem real, finally. Oh, it was real enough to me, Brian. Seeing Eddie in that chapel this afternoon. Oh, and what about, you know, the, the burial? Have you decided what to do yet? I, I don't know what to do. Called his lawyer in Los Angeles. How about his ex-wife? Which one? No, I think it's better to talk to the lawyer. He'll know what Eddie wanted. I wish I knew what Eddie wanted. What? He was trying to tell me before he died. My God, Nola, have you forgotten? Brian isn't Owen's child. He's my son. Eddie Vaughn, don't you ever say that aloud again. Do you hear me? You swore to me that you would never mention that again. That was then, Nola. That was 25 years ago. And it's just as important to me as it was then. No, it's more important now. My marriage is in enough trouble as it is. Are you trying to end it completely? Is that what you want to do? No, of course because not. Because that's exactly what you'll do if Owen learns the truth. Mom, are you okay? Poor Eddie. Poor Eddie. Maybe we shouldn't watch this damn news program. No, Danny, please. I just have to see it. Besides, I think Eddie would be very disappointed if we didn't see it. His last spectacular publicity stunt. Oh. Brian, that's a dreadful thing to say. I'm sorry, Mom. I didn't mean it that way. But you've got to admit, with all of Eddie's talk about the curse on this picture and all the things that went wrong with making it... Brian, the movie is made. The fire didn't happen until after the final day of shooting. And there was no curse on the picture, Brian. It was just carelessness. And I still don't understand how it happened, though. I told you everything I can remember. When I turned on the lights, there was this terrible sort of flash. I'm sure something was wrong with the wiring. There must have been. And I'm sure we had it very carefully checked before we started shooting. We knew that the wiring was faulty the minute we saw that soundstage, and we had it all redone at no small expense, I might add. I don't mean to sound crass, Daddy, but the soundstage was insured. Of course we were insured, darling. We had to be. I mean, really, what difference does that make? I'm sure the insurance company will investigate, Paige. Uh, 
They'll probably be able to tell us what the cause was. Uh, are we going to watch the program, right. aren't we? The release of Owen Madison's film, Mansion of the Damned, may be longer in coming than expected. Because one scene, definitely not on the shooting schedule, was this one that took place last night at the movie soundstage. The fire was first spotted by Glenboro Deputy Sheriff Sam Birdwell, who called out the volunteer fire department. But by the time Glenboro's fire department arrived at the scene, the blaze was completely out of control. Fortunately, the movie's star, actress Nola Patterson, who was on the soundstage when the fire started, managed to escape without harm. However, press agent Eddie Staten Vaughn wasn't as lucky. Mr. Vaughn entered the burning building under the impression that Miss Patterson was still inside. Apparently, he was overcome by smoke inhalation. Volunteer firemen managed to drag him outside, but they were too late to save his life. Eddie Vaughn was one of the unique breed of Hollywood personalities, a man who never made the spotlight, but who stood behind it, illuminating the sometimes quite ordinary people and events with a glow that made them appear magical. It's the gift of people like Eddie Vaughn to project an image of Hollywood celebrities as magnified as the image they project on the screen. There aren't many Eddie Vaughns left, but we feel that if there were a screenwriter in heaven, he couldn't have plotted a more dramatic end to Eddie Vaughn's life. The hero rushing into a burning building to save his best friend's wife. In this time, it wasn't Hokum and it wasn't Hype. It was Eddie Vaughn. Fade out, the end. Oh, God, Daddy. If I had been in Glenboro five minutes earlier, I could have saved him. Wait a minute, let me get this straight. You went out there to see Nola Madison. Yeah, yeah, she uh, called me right after I accepted your dinner invitation and said that we should get together. She thought that I should come out to the studio because the mansion of the damned set was being struck. Well, that was nice and friendly of her. Yeah, and then we were supposed to go somewhere and uh, talk. About what? I mean, if it's any of my business. Well, I think you know what we were going to talk about, Steve. She knows about you and her husband, right? Yes, of course she knows. Owen doesn't like to keep secrets. I've been trying to explain that to you, Steve. He doesn't like lying to his wife. So the meeting was canceled because of the fire, right? Yes. What about Eddie Vaughn? What was he doing out there? Uh, I don't know. He, uh, I guess he went out there to find out why Mrs. Madison wasn't at the party. And, and then he walked into the building. <laughs> God! Hey, come on, baby, it's gonna be all right. Here. Come on. I'm sorry. Oh, my eyes a little red, huh? Mm-hmm. So is your hair. Steve, I don't know why you put up with me. I really don't. Do you really not know why? The way I've treated you? Oh my God. The way I reacted when you asked me to marry you? You know, that was... It was the most beautiful question anybody ever asked me. I gave you such a rotten answer. No. No, you didn't. You gave it to me straight. You said you didn't want to be married. That you had something else you wanted to do something else steve not someone else yeah well i guess that was true then look i just didn't think that i could make them both work that's all i mean learning how to be a cop and a wife at the same time yeah not too many cops get married to each other it's not because i didn't care for you i know I did. I still do. Yeah, careful. I've been a little afraid to say that. Afraid that, that maybe you would misunderstand me. Or think I was a hypocrite. Because, <laughs> you see, Steve, I do care for you. But I care for Owen, too. Oh, God, that sounds awful. 
No. Just honest. Steve. You know, I never thought that I'd be able to... You know, it's impossible for two people to... care. You know, you're always told when you grow up that... there's only one person for you, you know? When you fall in love, there's just one person that... you're supposed to feel right about. You know, all the books and all the movies, they all tell you that... that's the way it's supposed to be. It's just not that way for me. You know, I remember a guy named Rainy Cooper. And he was very special to you at one time. <laughs> well, you think Cliff Nelson's right about me? Maybe I've got some sort of a complex? <laughs> Cliff Nelson. Cliff Nelson is the last person in the world you want to ask about getting your head on straight. Cliff's... He's so messed up, his head's so crooked, he can't even keep his hat on. Well, Steve, haven't you ever felt this way? I mean, haven't you ever not known what you want? Yeah. Oh, sure. When I was recovering from being a teenager, I think I had a crush on a dozen girls. A couple of them didn't even know I, I was alive. I can't imagine that. What happened? Well, I found someone special someone i cared about and kept on caring about even though she had a lot of her own problems she had a father who was stealing the city blind she had a crush on a killer she got mixed up with a married man you know I'm beginning to think that maybe all those romantic ideas in the movies and the novels, well, maybe they're true. That for someone, there is someone special forsaking all others. God, where have I heard that before? <laughs> the marriage ceremony. Oh, sorry. Don't hear that often. You'll hear one soon enough. When Calvin and Star get married. Oh. Yeah. Well, I guess I better be going. Deborah, I still love you. You haven't kissed me in one hell of a long time. Detective? I have to be back at work soon. Napoli's already on the site in Glenboro. He says that he thinks the fire definitely is of suspicious origin, but um, that's not really gospel. I mean, he hasn't made an official investigation yet. He can't do that until you give the word. Deputy, a man died in that fire. If it's arson, then we have a homicide case out yes, there. Yes, sir, that is definitely true. That's why I thought I should tell you about all this now. All right, we don't need to wait for an official request. You tell Napoli to dig up what he can before the ashes get cold. I'll get him right on it. Come on in. Oh, oh hi, Calvin. Doc. Chief, you said you wanted that autopsy report as soon oh, yeah. as possible. Stick around. This is about the fire victim. Yeah, there's no question as to how Mr. Vaughn died. It's smoke inhalation. So he was alive during the fire? Yeah, definitely. There's smoke uh, stains in the nostrils, air passage, uh, carbon monoxide in the blood. Well, that means that the story that Mrs. Madison told us then is uh, accurate, mm -hmm. at least as far as that's concerned. I mean, the guy actually walked right into a burning building. Yeah, a number of bruises on the body also probably sustained as he was trying to fight his way through the flames. What was he trying to do, be a hero or something? Let's not give him a medal yet. Well, look, I uh, got to call Glenboro. Lou's waiting here for us. Excuse me. Okay. Does the fire look suspicious? Can't be sure yet. Glenboro police have asked for our assistance, so we're going to give it to them. You know these movie people, don't you? Oh, some of them. I, I treated Paige Madison once. I think my wife and I were the only outsiders allowed on the set. 
for uh, Mansion of the Damned while they were shooting. I was there to treat that actor, Trent Archer. What's your wife doing on the set? Oh, she's on a news assignment. Yeah, she interviewed me the other day. I've been watching your program. You married a beautiful woman, Doctor. And yes, I did. I did too once. Oh, really? But that's over now. Is that my report? Yes, sure. Thanks. Chief, uh, you do much uh, socializing? Not much. Well, my wife just said to me last night, we were watching a repeat of that uh, interview of yours, as a matter of fact. You probably don't know many people in Monticello yet. Mostly cops and crooks, Doctor, and a few politicians. Yeah. Well, no comment. But she, she wondered if you might like to have dinner with us some night. How about it? Sure, I'd love to. But listen, just the three of us. No blind dates. That's, that's how I met my wife. Well, if we don't find it, then we have to send somebody out to buy a copy because Dr. Lennox is not going to be very happy if we don't show a copy of his masterpiece on the air. And that's the reason he agreed to do this interview this evening, you know. Goodness among us, here it is. Ah, great. Thank you. Herbert Broderick Lennox. Well, that's a name for you. Hmm. Is he a psychiatrist? Yes, he is. He's going to uh, be here a little early tonight so we can talk before the interview. Mm hmm. <sighs> Think about Talking to a psychiatrist is you always kind of worry if he's analyzing you. Hmm. Well, I don't know. The only psychiatrist I ever knew was when I was in prison. Well, you liked him, didn't you? Well, yeah, he met well. He tried to help. I guess I was kind of hostile to him, though, and considering the circumstances. I mean, I did think I was going crazy. It must have been an awful period in your life, all those needless fears about your sanity. Needless? I mean, how could you say needless, especially after I find out that my mother spent the last years of her life in a mental institution? Yes, but then you found out that your mother is rather other than Margot Huntington. Yeah. I've got to read this book, <clears throat> Madness Among Us. You know, the title gives me the shivers. Mm. The book does, too, for that matter. Do you know what this is about? No. It's about psychopaths that function in society without giving themselves way. Look at this. This is what we were just talking about. The role of heredity. Oh, come on. I don't know how much weight I put on heredity, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm just as glad my mother didn't spend... Oh, I'm sorry. But listen to what am I saying? I don't know. Well, I, 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 she was Miles' mother. Well, come on. I mean, there's... There's no reason why Miles would have inher inherited any kind of mental deficiency. I mean, just look at him. You, you can tell that. Just don't worry about it, okay? I mean, I know perfectly well that there is a you know, very slight connection between heredity and, and, and mental illness. I mean, there are dozens of other factors involved. <laughs> Besides, if, if Miles isn't going to worry about it, why should I? Yes. Yes, this is he. Ackerman's secretary. I'm sorry, what was that? Well, that's very thoughtful of you. No, 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 it's just a little surprising, that's all. Uh, fine. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, he's coming here. E Eddie's attorney? Yeah, his secretary said that he was already on the plane. Well, that's good. He can determine the disposition of the body. Oh, God. Oh, Nola. Just to refer to Eddie as the, the body. This has been a terrible shock for you. I know it. I don't know. It's just taking the heart out of me, Nola. The idea of going out to Hollywood and getting this picture finished, I don't know it. It just doesn't seem important anymore. Oh, no. but it is. Remember what Brian said. It's even more important now. <laughs> you, you can't just th th let it all go to waste. No. All that hard work that Eddie put in to get you're the right. picture started. You're right. You're right. I, I guess I'm just depressed. That's all. Well, I understand, darling. Yeah. How could you feel otherwise? Of course. Uh, well, I'll go change and then we can all have a nice quiet dinner together. Uh, Nola, I... Uh, uh, won't be here. I have some things I've got to do. I see. Well, I'll go change anyway.
Hi. Is it okay to talk? Oh, yeah. Owen, hello. Yeah, I'm alone. Uh, how are you? How's the family? Deborah, there's a pole over this house that you could cut with a knife. But uh, to be expected, of course. Well, I'm, I'm very sorry about what happened, Owen. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, Deborah, listen, are you free tonight? Because if you were, it would just be the biggest favor in the world you could do to me. I, I really need to talk to you tonight more than you can possibly imagine. I, uh, well, yeah, I am free. Uh, do you think it's a very good... Oh, uh, Deborah, I've, I, I've got to see you. <laughs> Please. Can we, uh, we go to our mondos? Oh, listen, don't, don't worry. I'll, I'll get us in there. Um, let's see. How about, um, pick you up about 8 o'clock? All right. Oh, uh, hello, uh, Ar Armando. It's Owen Madison here. Well, I'm fine. Uh, how are you? Good. Ar Armando, I know it's a little last minute, but is it possible for you to put a little table for two aside uh, this evening? About uh, 8.15? Okay, I'll wait. Oh, Armando, that's terrific. Yeah, fine. Listen, I appreciate this very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Is this Armando? Uh, this is Mrs. Madison, Armando. M my husband just called you. Well, he made a slight mistake about that reservation. It's not for two, it's for three. <clears throat> yes, yes, we have a guest with us. I is that all right? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yes, thank, thank you. Goodbye. Yes, thank you very much. a few minutes. Excuse me, but it's very important that we talk to Mr. Madison. Maybe you could come back uh, later. Look, perhaps you didn't understand us. This is a police matter. Look, tell Mr. Madison that Steve Guthrie is here. I'm sure he'll talk to us. Well, all right. It's been a long time since I've been here. Seems like a year since Paige had all that trouble. All right. And now look at her, she's a movie star, right? Yeah, well, why don't we wait until the movie comes out, huh? You didn't get to see any of it, did you? Nope, just the set. That, that was the time that the uh, chandelier fell and clipped. Right, right, well, it's all ashes now, and uh, the only one getting clipped is the insurance company. Jeez. Hello. Hello, Owen. I'm sure you remember Calvin Stoner. Of course I do. It's nice to see you. How do you do? Uh, is this a condolence? Paul, I'm afraid I'm a, a little bit of a hurry. No, as a matter of fact, it's about the uh, fire out at the studio. Oh, huh? what about it? Well, there's been a police investigation, Mr. Madison. We just recently got our preliminary reports back. Fortunately, it didn't take long to find out what happened out there. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm sure the insurance company are going to want to find out. Well, I don't know how happy you are going to be about the conclusion. It looks like a case of arson. Arson? Yes, the fire was set deliberately. Which would, and that's why it's become a police matter. Which would mean that Eddie Vaughn's death is a homicide.
fire was started by an amateur. That's why it was so easy to spot. You see, most people think that everything in a fire gets reduced to ashes, but that just is not the case. Our man found a gasoline can quite intact. Obviously, it had been used to help spread the flames. This is just incredible. I mean, why would anyone want to do that? Steve, you know. Galvin, what are you guys doing here? Oh, Paige, oh, Brian, no. listen, you're just not going to believe this. Steve told me that someone has deliberately set fire to the soundstage. Oh, come on. Where'd you get uh, that idea? It's not an idea, Brian. It's a verified fact. The uh, studio was insured, was it not? Well, yes, of course it was insured. What are you saying? That we set the fire to collect a few lousy grand? Is that it? Well, the insurance company says that you were insured for 35 lousy grand, and that was just the building. You had a separate policy for the well, equipment. Well, it's just not true. Come on, Steve. I mean, you honestly think that I'd set a torch to my own place? Steve, you know Daddy wouldn't do anything like that. Look, this picture cost us over a million dollars to make. Now, why would we want to set the place on fire? Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, please. Now, we're not here to make any accusations against anybody. We want you to know the facts, the same that the insurance company will know. And the most important thing that we're concerned about is the fact that a man died in the fire. All right, all right, all right. Okay, Detective Stoner, you said that you found a gas can in the place. That's right, and not the kind of thing you'd keep around a movie set, unless, of course, you were running a lawnmower or something. A lawnmower? Look, Steve, are you guys really sure you're right? I mean, my mother and Eddie Vaughn were the only two people on, at the place when it started fire. <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Look, we aren't drawing any conclusions about what happened out there. The place may have been set up for a burning, and they may have just accidentally caused the spark that started it. Eddie was killed in the fire. You can't okay, accuse him. Okay, all right, him. all right. Just, just hold it a minute. I guess there's something that I'd better tell you. What was that? It's about Eddie. It's about the things that he was doing. What do you mean, Dad? Brian, you remember that story that Eddie told us when he first came here with the screenplay about all the terrible things that were happening to the people who had tried to make mansion of the dam before? Yeah, the curse business, yeah. Right. And the people that were all killed. Uh-huh, and the fire that burnt down the building when they were filming the first time. Uh, you don't expect us to believe that the devil is responsible for this. Or the ghost of Hester Atherton. Steve, just listen to me, will you? All the things that happen in our production, and I mean all the things, the ghosts, the tripwires, the slide projections, I hate to say this, but they were Eddie's responsibility. Why? You mean even the chandelier that fell on Steve? Yes, yes. I'm, I'm terribly sorry about that, Steve. I, I really am. But after you were injured and Deborah found out, well, of course, I had to go straight. Wait a minute. Excuse me. What did you just say? Well, now, now listen. Don't blame Deborah for not telling you this before. Now, this, this was my doing. She didn't want to give Eddie away for my sake because she thought it might hurt the film. You mean Eddie concocted all this cursed stuff and Deborah knew about it? Yes. And then she told me about it the next day. Yeah, I know. She went out to the studio. And, Steve, I'm telling you, I went straight to Eddie and made him swear to me that there would be no more of these damn publicity stunts. And he just didn't keep his promise, is that it? I guess that's it. And you think that Eddie started this fire at the studio just for publicity, right? Well, and then was trapped in his own fire. Eddie would not be that foolish. Oh, my God. Steve, uh, uh, Calvin said that, uh, that gasoline was used in this fire, right? Uh, yes. Why? <sighs> because... Oh, damn it. I saw Eddie putting a can of gasoline into the trunk of his car just... just a couple of days ago. Oh, uh, why don't you come and pick me up? Because I'm expecting Dr. Lennox any minute now. Huh. I hope he's as cute as his picture. Lennox? Why is that name so familiar? Oh, I know. I saw an ad for that book of his in one, one of those medical journals. Uh, the Madness Among Us? Yep. That, yeah, it sounded like he had some interesting things to say. Well, I just hope he can make them short and sweet, because unfortunately I've only got about two and a half minutes to give him tonight. Oh, well, you better lay down the ground rules for him, because some of us medical types can be long-winded when we uh, start in on our favorite topics. I know I am. Wait a minute. What's your favorite topic? You. Oh, great. Well, come on over and tell me all about myself over dinner. And why don't you kind of hurry up, too, because uh, I have this terrible desire to kiss you. I'm halfway out the door. Okay. Bye-bye.
evolutional psychosis, schizophrenia, paranoia, manic depression. My God. I really appreciate this, you know. Everyone tells me that the best way to sell a book is to talk about it on television. Well, I can't promise you a bestseller, but, uh, you know, I really am fascinated by this book. I've been reading it for the past hour. I'm flattered. The truth is, I've been on television before with my last book, but unfortunately, the person who interviewed me never bothered to read anything but the blurb on the jacket. Well, I haven't quite finished it yet, but uh, I think I, I grasp the concept. The idea is that people should learn to recognize the symptoms of mental illness so that they can help other people. And themselves. Well, can people who are emotionally ill know that they're ill? They're usually the first to know. But unfortunately, they may not always recognize the signs as mental illness. Uh, they may blame circumstances or other people or the government, for that matter. You know, this chapter I thought was especially interesting. Uh, we might be able to talk about this. How you recognize the symptoms. Yeah, well, I hope that chapter isn't misunderstood. Because there was a review in a psychiatric journal which stated that I was treading on dangerous ground, asking laymen to become judges of neurotic or psychotic behavior. That isn't my intention, of course. I just think that, well, if we can educate people about warning signs for cancer or heart disease and so forth, why not teach them the signs of mental disorder? It sounds very good to me. It's just like other diseases, Miss Drake. Early detection helps the cure. But not all emotional illness can be cured, can it? Not all cases, no. You see, we just don't know enough yet. Schizophrenia, for instance, that's the most well, widespread... That's very psycho difficult to cure, isn't it? Uh, well, there used to be a lot of pessimism about it. But not anymore. There are many kinds of new treatment, including drug therapy. You know, there, there's one area that you don't really go into in your book in, in much depth. Uh, the causes. Uh, well, there are hundreds of books on psychology. I'm only concerned with recognition. Is it true that mental illness can be inherited? Well, many authorities believe schizophrenia is since it tends to run in families. However, m many believe that only the predisposition may be inherited, that environmental factors are just as important. Oh, I see. Yeah? Dr. Lennox here? They want him in makeup. Well, doctor, you are wanted. <laughs> the things I do for medicine. Yeah. See you on camera, Mr. Sure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, where was I? One of the reasons so many of us are slow in detecting mental abnormality is that some forms of schizophrenia, such as paranoia, are often characterized by apparently logical systems of false beliefs. The victim may be of high intelligence and therefore able to create a highly plausible structure for his delusions. Yeah? Or is that kiss that was promised? Oh, it's right here. Mm. Uh, you see, that's that was worth breaking the speed limit for. Oh, you didn't. <laughs> Who, me? With an MD on my license plate? Hmm. I was tempted. You about ready to go? Yeah, well, almost. Uh, I have that interview to do with Dr. Lennox. It'll just take 15 minutes. All right, all right. I'll wait around here, and then we'll go out and have a nice dinner by candlelight. How about that? Oh, hmm, that sounds terrific. Mm. Mm. Oh, is that the book? We get to keep it? I kind of like to read it. Sure, I'll, I'll remember to bring it home. Autographed. You know, it, it's really a good book. I've been reading it for the past hour. You know, when I was a kid, I used to read carloads of books on this subject. I suppose you know why. Because of your mother? Yeah, sure. I was trying to figure out what her illness was all about. Did you? What, at that age? No, not really. Well, you did find out what it was, didn't you? I mean, the name. Sure, I found out the name for all the good that did me. Schizophrenia. Yeah? All ready for you, Mr. Oh, good, coming. Well, honey, I need the book. Okay. Okay. See you later.
Okay, thanks, Armando. Yeah, I knew I could count on you. Uh, listen, um, we'll be there. Are you ready to go? Yeah. We'll, we'll be there in about, uh, let's say, about 15 minutes. How's that? Okay, good. Fine. All right, we'll see you then. Bye-bye. Well, that's no problem. He can still, still sit us. Good. Sorry I'm so late. Just Couldn't be helped. It was, uh... In fact, you can thank your friend Steve. Steve? Huh? He and, uh, Calvin dropped by to see me this evening. It seems that the police have found evidence that it was Eddie who was set fire to the soundstage. What? Oh, oh, wait, come on, I don't believe that. Well, I'm afraid it's true. The only thing is that he didn't mean to kill himself in the process. Poor Eddie. Oh, boy, I'm telling you, I guess he just figured it was some sort of publicity stunt, huh? For Mansion of the Dam, the final last testament of Hester Atherton. Oh, and you said that he promised never to do things like that. Maybe he thought that I'd never find out. To burn down a whole soundstage? Well, he knew that the place was insured, and I, was, had, I had no earthly use for it at all once the, the movie was over. I certainly can't sell it. There's nobody around here in Monticello who makes movies. You know this for a fact? I'm afraid it's pretty obvious. You see, Brian said that he saw Eddie put a gas can into the trunk of his car. Something that Eddie doesn't do too often. The can came from our garage. I don't believe this. Yeah. Does that mean that Steve knows about Eddie's tricks? Well, I had to tell him the whole story. Well, Deborah, otherwise I'm going to be a suspect myself, aren't I? Oh, yeah, you wouldn't want that, would you? Well, what do you expect me to do? Just cancel the whole trip to California and stay here and fight an arson charge with an attempt to defraud? Oh, so you're planning on going to California? Yeah, I, I suppose so. Yeah, well, I guess you have to, don't you? You wouldn't want the movie to suffer because of that. Well, it's got to be finished, you know. It's got to be edited. It's got to be sold. There are a lot of people that are depending on this. Only one problem is I have to go about 2,000 miles away from you. Well, it's not forever. Well, I don't know how long it's going to be for. Could be weeks, could be months. Deborah, I just don't know if I'm going to be able to survive without you. Well, you will survive, Owen. Oh, sure. Maybe I'll be lucky, huh? Maybe find myself an editor, make a nice little distribution deal. A couple of weeks based on a rough cut, huh? Look, just do what you have to do. Okay. Oh, and look, I know how important this movie is to you. Deborah, what? it's not important to me. Look, it's important to Nolan. It's important to Brian, to Paige. It's not important to me. Don't you understand that? What's important to me is you. Look, I think we just better get outside and get some fresh air and have a little drink and some dinner, okay? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, all right? I didn't mean to be selfish here. <laughs> Look, I, I don't want to use you as a crutch, all right? Oh, I, I don't mind. Owen! Oh, oh. oh. Honestly. I like being needed, I really do. I... It's a feeling that I never get with Steve. Never mind. Let's go. Okay. need you. You sure I can't get you more than just this? Oh, Lillian, this is just fine. Thank you. You too ought to eat more hot food. <laughs> Don't be so maternal, Lillian. Well, if I was your mama, I wouldn't let you get away with eating the way you do. Thank you, Lillian. Where is Mom Paige? I haven't seen her all evening. Oh, I haven't any idea, but, um, she might be at the chapel with Uncle Eddie. Oh, that's one thing I'm not looking forward to, a funeral. 
Well, it's hardly my idea of a good time either. Lillian, didn't you say something about coffee? Well, it should be ready by now. What are we going to tell her? <laughs> about what? When this whole household moves away next week. Mom and Dad and I to California, and you off to where, Paige? I don't know. I mean, I'm certainly not going to stay in this house by myself. I thought I might stay with Deborah for a while and then look for a job. Well, chances are Mom and Dad won't be coming back to Monticello. Why do you say that? Well, if the, pic if the picture is a success, uh, Mom's not going to want to isolate herself here anymore. Monticello was exiled for her, Paige. Maybe the same is true of Dad. You're probably right. I mean, once the movie is released, I might want to stay in Beverly Hills. That would be like turning back time. I don't know if anyone can do that. Wish we could. Wouldn't do any good. Not in our case. I guess not. I guess we'd need a time machine. Mm. There's a lady on the phone that wants to talk to your father. Who is she? She said her name is Ackerman. Ackerman, Uncle Eddie's lawyer. Yeah, it must be his wife. I'll talk to her in here, Lily. Hello. Mr. Madison. Uh, no, no, this is his son, Brian. Uh, my father uh, isn't in at the moment. Are you expecting him soon? This is Lila Ackerman, Mr. Vaughn's attorney. Your is it? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Mr. Madison spoke to my husband. He probably didn't realize that I'm the attorney in the family. <laughs> anyway, I'm here at the hotel, and I'd like to talk to Mr. Madison as soon as possible. I see. Well, uh, I can't be sure when he'll be back. Probably not before 10, though. Well, I might as well sit around there as this hotel room. And I do think it's important that we talk. Would it be all right if I stopped by your door at around, uh, well, a little after 10? Sure, Mrs. Ackerman, that'll be fine. And I hope you'll be there too, Brian. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be here. I think it's very nice Uncle Eddie has a woman lawyer. Yeah, I'm just a little surprised, that's all. I'm surprised she flew out here this fast. Well, we do have to decide where to bury Uncle Eddie. She didn't have to fly out here just for that. I guess we'll see more when she gets here after 10. Mm. I just hope Dad's going to be here. Did he say where he was going? No. I bet I can guess. So can I. You know something? I don't blame him, Paige. He's been pretty shaken up by this whole thing. So has Mom, for that matter. Good evening. Welcome to Armanda's. I have a reservation for two. The name is Linter's. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, show Mr. Lenders to table number two. Come along, my dear. Thank you. Oh, good evening, oh, Mr. Madison. Nice How are you tonight? You. Fine, just fine. Uh, listen, I hope that uh, Armando has changed our reservation. We called a little while ago. Oh, yes, your table is all ready. Oh, this way, please. Okay. In fact, Mrs. Madison is already here. Mrs. Madison. Oh, and darling. And Deborah, how lovely you look. No. What is this? This, darling, is a table for three. Please, sit down. It seems to me that you know more about all this than you're letting on. 
The truth is, my husband knew and he told me. That's why I thought I should deliver these papers to you in person. It seemed very impersonal to simply mail them to you or tell you the contents over the telephone. Mrs. Ackerman, what is this all about? Perhaps you should look at this. Owen, what, what does it say? To my son, Brian. Yes, Mr. Madison. Brian Madison is the beneficiary of Eddie's will. Well, then he, he did mean it figuratively. I, I mean, he always considered Brian like a son. Well, that is what he meant, you realize. It has to be. Maybe this letter will tell us. Oh, wait. The letter's for Brian, isn't it? Yes. I think that is what he intended. I think under the circumstances, Brian won't lie. Oh, don't. It's wrong. Mrs. Ackerman, you know this is wrong. Well, I do know that Eddie considered Mr. Madison his closest friend. At any rate, I think I'd better leave now. I'll be at the Monticello Arms if you need me. You can reach me there until tomorrow afternoon. I'll show myself out. Good night. M Mrs. Ackerman. Well, I guess I all have to do is figure out Eddie's little chicken marks. Hmm? My God. What is it? Oh, well, Eddie claims that Brian is his son, not mine. that, Owen. Somehow I don't think there's anything in this, Nola, that you don't already know. Dear Brian, here it is, Eddie Vaughn's last press release. I remember when you were a kid, when I read you stories, you always liked surprise endings. I suppose what I'm about to tell you now is the topper of them all. I don't know how else to say it, Brian, except straight and simple. I'm your father. Your real father. It's not that I wanted to keep it a secret this long. Twenty-five years ago, when I found out that Nola was expecting my child, I wanted to shout the news from the rooftops. But I had a couple of very good reasons for keeping quiet, and you have every right to know what they were. First of all, kid, I always loved your mom. <laughs> that was never any secret. But I knew Nola never loved me enough to make it work between us. You see, I cared too much about her happiness to try and make her stay with someone she really didn't want to be tied down to. Besides, <laughs> you know what a mess I made of my marriages. And I also wasn't too sure if I was cut out to be the kind of dad that you deserved. But I knew that Owen was, and I was right. I can't think of anyone I've ever respected or admired more. And Nola loved him, so I figured that was the best arrangement. When I see the fine man you've grown to be, I know I made the right decision. By the time you read this, I won't be around. But I want to be a fond memory for you, Brian, and for Owen, too. So please, kid, don't hate me for what I did or for my wanting the truth to come out now. I just want you to remember me as family. Goodbye, son. Your loving father, Eddie. How touching. Is that all you could say? I never knew Eddie could be this creative. Are you saying this isn't true? Well, it's a lie, Owen. It's all a lie. Nola, the only time Eddie ever even stretched the truth was to hype some project that he was promoting. On a man-to-man -man basis, he was the most honest man I ever met. How can you possibly believe that he was Brian's father? Why would he invent all this? Why would he seal it up until his death? Well, he, he said it himself in that letter. Uh, he 
He loved me. He was jealous of you. And I suppose this is his way of getting back at you for his unrequited oh, love. Come on. No, I don't believe that for a minute. Well, then, you, you know how much he cared for Brian. Perhaps it was the act of a man who realized he wasn't getting any younger and had very little to show for his life. By declaring himself to be Brian's father, he was buying himself a bit of immortality. Immortality? Are you kidding me? He is not Brian's father. You are. Nola, the more I think about this letter, the more sense it makes. It fits the pattern of Eddie's life exactly. How? Eddie was always willing to do whatever you want him to do, as long as, as, long as he thought that it was going to make you happy. We were nothing more than good friends. In fact, he cared so much about your happiness, it probably cost him his life, didn't it? How can you say that? No, it was Eddie who concocted all those strange goings on at the soundstage, wasn't it? Recreating the curses of Mansion of the Damned. It, to promote the picture, To yes. promote you, Nola, to promote you. He tried to burn down that soundstage as the ultimate publicity stunt. Only he wasn't very proficient at arson, was he? Oh, my God. Of course. That's what Eddie was trying to tell Brian the night that he died, wasn't it? He was trying to tell him the truth. Isn't that right, Nola? He was trying to tell him that he was his father. Oh, God, Nola. How could you have gone such lengths? Was I such a catch that you had to do that? I loved you, Owen. You can't imagine how much I, I had to do it. And you always knew what you had to do, didn't you, Noel, ever since I met you? I didn't love Eddie. I didn't want him to be the father of my child. I hated the idea. I wanted you. And you got me, didn't you, with a very convenient lie. Well, you have something to thank Eddie for, don't you? Look, you didn't marry me just because of Brian. I know you didn't. You loved me. Yes, I did. I did love you. Don't use the past tense, Owen, oh, please. Look, what I did was terribly wrong. I, I know that, but I was so desperate. What? Owen, you loved Brian as your own son. I know you did. Yes, I did, and I still do, Nola. That's why it hurt me so much to see him suffer. Oh, my God, Nola, we made them both suffer. Paige and Brian. I, because I thought they were brother and sister. But you knew the truth all along, didn't you? so sure that in time they, they would meet others and forget about this crush they had on yes. each other. Unfortunately, that didn't work out, did it? So what happened? Brian went off and joined the Navy. And Paige, what did she do when she found out that Brian was her, was her brother? She started hanging around with some thug, which almost got her killed. But it wasn't easy for me, Owen. You know how heartsick I was oh. when Brian left. Oh, look the worst thing that anyone could have done. You were willing to ruin those two kids' lives just to promote your little lie. Look, the only reason I did those things was because I loved you. I no. was so afraid of losing you. I'm sorry, Nola. I'm sorry. I just can't forgive you for that. That's the worst thing that anyone could have done. No, you've got to forgive me, Owen. Oh, please, I'm begging no, you. No, no, no. Too, too much has happened, Nola. Too many people have been hurt. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, thank you for a wonderful dinner. You're welcome, Draper. I'm glad you enjoyed it. The way you ate, dear, you think you never ate at home. Well, it's just that tonight's dinner was a nice change of pace from the recent bill of fare at the Scott House. Let me guess. I'll bet you've been dining on the infamous Thanksgiving dinner leftovers. Oh, yes, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All right, all right, that's enough. Miles and Nicole and little Adam came over for dinner on Thanksgiving, and, well, I'm not used to cooking for all those people, and I don't, thought there wouldn't be enough food, so I bought a large turkey. <laughs> Isn't that always the case? Hmm. We just finished our turkey last night. Thank goodness. <laughs> well, I'm glad you two accepted our invitation for tonight. It's been quite a while since the four of us have gotten together socially. Well, I think you can blame that on your partner here, Mike, who's been burning the midnight oil. Mm, no, wait a minute. Not so much recently. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, David, because I know how hard you've been working. Mm. And I was afraid it was going to affect your health. Well, I have been working to pay off that debt to Margot. But ever since I read the last law journal, there's no great urgency to put a ribbon around my caseload. I'm going to be in Monticello for quite a while. 
Yeah. It's very disappointing to read that uh, Stuart Paxton had filled the job, but Draper, it, it won't help to brood over it, so... Well, I'm trying to be as philosophical as I can. Good. Yeah, I just... I just believe that the job was never meant to be. Yeah. Well, I am glad they filled that position. Saves a lot of wear and tear on my nerves. That's true. It would have been at least six weeks before Henson got back from Europe, and heaven knows how long before he even set up an interview. And I would have been building my hopes higher and higher for no real purpose at all. It does appear as if Mr. Henson had his mind made up a long time ago. Honey, I am more and more convinced that he just said that he would give uh, Draper a second chance at that job simply to play KQ. Yeah. And, and Mike, I really appreciate your talking to Henson for me. But I have a feeling that even if I'd come across as another Clarence Darrow, he wouldn't have changed his mind. You may be right, Draper. At least I'm glad you're making a realistic appraisal of the situation. Oh, no, Mike. He talks a good game, but in actuality, he has not truly accepted the fact that he will not be working with that firm. Why do you say that? Well, normally, Draper is a very sound sleeper. Past couple of nights, he's been tossing and turning and muttering some not-so-very-nice things about Mr. Henson. Oh, I don't do that. Y do I? Well... <laughs> I just keep telling Draper to consider it their loss. I couldn't agree with you more, April. Yes, and considering how things are right now, maybe it's all for the better. Because when you, when you relocate, it, well, it's such an adjustment, mm -hmm. much more so for a couple who's going to have a baby. Well, I admit that I'm rather happy that we're staying in Monticello and that our baby will be born among our friends and our family. I know what you mean. <laughs> okay, excuse me, I'm going to get the coffee. Oh, let me help. No, that's all right. Oh, no, 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 I want it. to. Oh, excuse me. Oh, Mike. Let me be honest with you. I'm just as glad that that New York business is all taken care of and out of my hands now. Draper, there's one thing you shouldn't forget. There was only one partner who didn't feel that you were well qualified for that job. Yeah. And I began to think that having Henson as an associate wasn't such a terrific thing after all. Well, his conduct in this case uh, was rather unethical. Certainly doesn't speak well for the man. Well, maybe he got his business ethics from a former client of his. Oh? Margot. Small world, isn't it? Margot was a client of Henson's about ten years ago. I see. I believe I didn't plug in the coffee. Well, things like that happen. Uh, Nancy, you know, helping you wasn't the only reason I came in here. I have to ask you something. Go ahead. When Mike was in New York, did Henson tell him why he refused to hire Draper? Now, why do you ask that? It's just that when the four of us were discussing Draper's problem, I got a kind of funny feeling. About what? Well, you and Mike were discussing the situation rather knowledgeably. Well, we've tried to keep up with the situation. Almost as if there's something you know that you don't want to tell. April, believe me, if we had any information that would be helpful to Draper, we would certainly tell him. Does that mean you know something that you uh, think it would be in Draper's best interest not to know? That's interesting. What is it? I had the same feeling about you inside that you had of us. April, how much do you know? I know that it was Margot. And you know that too, don't you, Nancy? Margot was only trying to help me, Nancy. She was not trying to hurt Draper. Granted, but she did not help him. No, she didn't. Ever since uh, Draper was approached about this job in New York, Margot was aware of the fact that I was not keen on relocating, and she saw no reason for Draper to leave Monticello when he and Mike had a, a very good practice right here. And she didn't want to see you move so far away. No, I'm sure that was the major reason. Anyway, she's known Henson for years, so she called him and informed him of the situation. She told Mr. Henson that Draper was wrong for the job. That's what she did. Now, should she be the one to judge his competence as a lawyer? <laughs> Obviously, for some reason, Henson thought so. Well, because Draper never got a reasonable explanation for that decision, it's been a very sore point with him. Nancy, I hate to think what Draper would do if he ever found out. April, how long have you known what Margot did? 
About two weeks. Nancy, I was not party to the deception. No matter how much I did not want to move out of Monticello, I knew how much Draper wanted that job and how much he deserved it. Mm -hmm. So, Margot told you? Oh, slip of the tongue. She, uh, she couldn't understand why Henson had changed his mind about seeing Draper. I see. Nancy, when I found out, I was absolutely livid. Well, I don't doubt it. And I told Margot exactly how I felt. And she tried to make amends. She did? In what way? She agreed to call Henson and to tell him that everything she had told him previously about Draper was false. And Nancy, I was standing right there when she made that call. Not only did Henson agree to see Draper, he agreed to keep an open mind. Well... Nancy, uh, there's very little of what I've told you right now that you didn't already know. How and when did you find out? Look, because of the effect that this was having on Draper's work, Mike and I did a little, well, a little questioning ourselves. I see. Look, I know Margot handled this whole entire thing wrong, but she meant well, Nancy. I believe that. I have to believe it. And if Draper finds out, he will never speak to her again, and I can't let that happen. Oh, I know this is rough for you, because you love them both. It was, they were just getting to a point where they could be civil with one another. Well, um, don't worry about Mike or me saying anything, okay? Because, uh, well, now that the job is filled, well, it, the matter's closed as far as we're concerned. Thank you. As much as I hate to keep the truth from Draper, under the circumstances, I... I don't see what else I can do. So what do you say, nice long ski weekend? Sometime next month, Mrs. Goodman would be happy to stay with that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, oh, what did you come say? Come on. Oh, my mind was wondering. I know, it's been that way all night. What's the matter with you? Well, nothing. Oh, I may be a little tired. Oh, no, you're concerned about something. No, I'm not. Really. Fine. Can I try my hand at mind reading? Be my guest. You're still troubled about that interview you did as part of the newscast tonight. You mean my discussion with Dr. Lennox? Yes. By the way, I thought you tried to avoid having authors on to talk about their own books. Usually I do. I know you get dozens of review copies every week with offers of writers coming on to talk. Why'd you pick this one? Well, it just seemed to me that The Madness Among Us has something very important to offer. That may be, but you've got a particular interest in the topic, don't you? Why do you say that? I will that? just bet that you have that doctor on so you can get some expert information about whether or not you might have to deal with the problem yourself. Files? I'm sorry, but every, ever since you found out that my mother suffered from schizophrenia, you've been scared to death that I might follow in her footsteps. Oh, honey, don't be silly. Listen, you are the sanest person that I know. If I were to inherit the problem, the chances are it would have shown up many years ago. I know. Now, honey, can we talk about this another time? All right, but I'm not just making these assurances for you, you know. Sweetie, I know it's that. It's a scary thing to realize you might be susceptible to inheriting mental illness. I mean, when I found out my mother died in an institution, I was frightened. Well, you're not now, are you? No, because I know it's very unlikely I would inherit the problem. When one parent is schizophrenic, the, the odds that a child will also develop mental problems are 90 to 95 percent against. Well, that's what Dr. Lennox told me. They seem like very good odds to me. I wouldn't lie to you, Nicole. You have nothing to worry about. Who am I to argue with a doctor? Why the suitcase? <laughs> well, that's usually what one takes along on a trip. Are you leaving? Uh, Dad, uh, ever since we finished Mansion of the Damned, I've, I've been kind of restless. I... Oh, hell, there isn't any reason for me to hang around Monticello. I see. 
So, uh, where are you going? I plan on catching the late flight to Los Angeles. I thought we were all going out there next week. I thought we'd probably all go together. Well, uh, yeah, I, I talked to a friend of mine who lives in West L.A. He's going to be away for a couple weeks on business, and he needs a house sitter to keep an eye on the place. I, I thought it would be a good idea to head out there now. Sure. Get rid of your Midwest pallor. Start working on the tan. Yeah, yeah. And uh, by the time you get out there, I'll be raring to go on post-production on the film. Dad, please, I just need some time by myself. Ryan. Ryan, sit down. I've got something to tell you. Look, I, I really do have to get Ryan. to the airport, Dad. It's important. All right. What's the matter? Brian, I've got something to tell you. It may make you reconsider leaving. I've just about made up my mind about that, Dad. Trust me, things change. In fact, what I have to tell you, Brian, may change your whole life. to a friend of mine who lives in West L.A. Uh, he's going to be away for a couple weeks on business and could use a house sitter to keep an eye on the place. I thought it was a good idea for thought me to head out. thought it a good idea to get rid of your Midwest pallor and start working on your tan, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the time you arrive, I'll be raring to go on post-production on the picture, Dad. I, I really need to be by myself for Brian. a while. Brian. Brian, i got to talk to you. Dad, look, I really have to Brian, get to the it's, airport. it's important. Please, sit down. What is it? Brian, I have something to tell you. It might even get you to reconsider leaving. I've pretty much made up my mind about it. Trust that. me, Brian, things change. In fact, what I have to tell you may change your whole life. All right. I'm listening. OK. Now, you know that Lila Ackerman was over here this evening. That's Eddie's attorney. Yes, I know. Did Eddie make any request as to where he wanted to be buried? Uh, no, no, there was no mention of that in any of the papers. Well, Eddie never was very good at handling the details of his private life. Brian, Eddie did leave a will. He named you as his heir. Me? He cared very much about you, Brian. And is that what's going to change my life, Dad? Eddie had a fortune salted away, and now I'm independently wealthy? No, no, Brian, he didn't, he didn't leave much of an estate. No, 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 that's, that's not the point. Of course not. Brian, you just can't put a price on what Eddie left you. Well, look, it's, it's all here in this, in this letter. Brian, Eddie's legacy is the truth. I don't understand this. Well, I think he said it pretty simply. Dad, it says here that... that Eddie's my real father. Yeah. That I'm his natural son. Oh, my God. Dad, is this true? ironic, isn't it? A little over three years ago, I told you the same thing, that I was your natural father. Yes, you did. I was just as shocked then. In fact, it hit you so hard, you packed another suitcase and went off and joined the Navy, didn't you? I didn't know what else to do. 
I felt my entire life was shattered. You were, you were Paige's dad. You are Paige's dad. Not mine. You were my stepfather. Well, apparently that is true. Brian, that's a truth I never found out until I read that. Oh my God. I know. It came as just as big a shock to me, believe me. Maybe even more so. Dad, I wonder if... I wonder if Eddie wasn't trying to tell me the truth. Before he died, he said he had something he wanted to tell me, something very important. Well, we'll never know for sure, Brian, but I wouldn't be surprised. But the important thing, surely, is that he did leave the truth behind him. Dad, do you realize we could have lived this lie for the rest of our lives? I know, I know. <sighs> Didn't Mom ever tell you? Brian, 25 years ago, your mother became pregnant by a man that she didn't love. So she decided to tell the man that she did want to marry that she was carrying his child. You mean she wanted to make you feel as if you were obligated to him? Oh, yeah. oh, Nola knew what she was doing. After my marriage sour, after I got my divorce, I waited the reasonable time and I told Nola that I would do the right thing by her and marry her. And how in God's name could Eddie have permitted this deception? Come on, Brian. Eddie was always crazy about your mother. He would have always, he would have done anything she wanted. Including giving up his son? Oh, Brian, don't be too hard on him. That wasn't the only reason that Eddie went along with Nola's scheme. No. No, the letter says that Eddie thought you would make a better father. And Dad, he was right about that. I don't know, Brian. No. Oh. Sometimes I wonder. But Dad, kids don't make all those fine distinctions, father, stepfather. To me, you were always, you were always just Dad. And nothing will ever change that, Dad. This letter certainly hasn't changed it. Brian, I never made those distinctions either. And believe me, that letter doesn't change anything for me. Certainly between us. But Mom, Mom knew the truth. Yeah. She, she knew the truth for 25 years and she never said a word. Come on, Brian, I'm, I'm sure you know why. Look, you can't tell a lie like that. You can't live it for all those years and just drop it. It becomes too important. Don't you see that? It becomes the foundation for everything. Dad, she knew what she was doing to me. She was keeping Paige and me apart with this damn lie of hers, and she didn't even care. Ryan, she cared. She cared very much. She just couldn't help herself. Don't you see that? All right, Dad, uh, does Paige know any of this yet? No, no she doesn't. Lillian. Uh, Lillian, where's Paige? She said she was going to the movies. She should be back in about an hour. <sighs> Damn the movies. I, I don't know if I can wait that long. Come on, Brian. You've waited this long. You can wait another hour. I'm sure Paige will be back home soon. Look, I want you to be the one to tell her, OK? So I think I'll just uh, slip out for a little while. If anybody wants to know where I am, I'll be back soon. Your collar. Now, you're the one that dug up the facts that pinned this girl's murder on him. Yeah, and then I let the guy take my gun away from me. I could just see what the chief was thinking. Well, I just didn't have my mind on my job, and that's why the whole damn thing was my fault. And yeah, what's this I hear about? When, when, when Mallory came into the interrogating room, you told him the guy had, had your gun. Yeah, I did. Don't you think that was a little risky? I mean, he was pointing right, pointing the gun right in your face. I mean, he could have squeezed the trigger. Well, somehow I thought that the chief would react the way he did. It was good. Terrific. You know what you did? You let the chief become a big hero. Well? Well, don't you think his head is big enough as is? Oh, Steve, I don't think that's fair. I really don't. He doesn't go around bragging about what a great cop he is. No, that's right. But he never misses an opportunity to let us know when we've messed up. Well, I'm just glad he was able to handle himself. 
Hey, you might be talking to a corpse right now. Oh, come on. You don't think Stokes would have gotten out of this building alive, do you? Look, all I cared about was getting out of that situation. That is what Chief Mallory did for me. Terrific. Well, maybe I'm just a little bit jealous. Look, the next time you get in hot water, I wish you'd wait until I'm around, okay? You like bubble baths. Uh, yeah. Look, I'm just happy everything came out okay. I just want you to be a little more careful, Chicky. Yes, sir. Uh, you that? Detective Saxon's office, the butler speaking. What was that? Uh, who's this? This is Chief Mallory. Who is this? Uh, the name is Jives, sir. Jives with a capital J. Uh huh. You're on your own. Ooh. Hello. Hello, this is the Chief. I want you to tell Guthrie that I think he does a lousy British accent. He thinks you do a lousy British accent. <laughs> um, if, if you're calling about the uh, Stokes case, I've got the report finished. How did you find the time with all your partying? Well, Steve was here to go over the Turner investigation with me. Well, the Turner case has been on the fire long enough. It can sit. I hate to disturb you, Detective, but I would like to see you in my office right away. Afraid this file is nothing more than interesting reading. There isn't anything there you can use to push for an indictment? Mr. Hayes refuses to sign a complaint against his son, my answer tied. But it's obvious from Dr. Cavanaugh's report that that wound was not self-inflicted. Mm, yeah, I'd say judging by young Benny's record here, he was trying to rip off his old man's store, and when his father kicked up a fuss, he shot him. Who'd want to protect a kid like that? Well, maybe he feels guilty for producing such a rotten child. He's probably more afraid of what the kid would do to him if he did tell the truth. Yeah, whatever. As long as he sticks to this fairy tale about shooting himself while he was cleaning the gun, there is nothing we can do. I don't care what his reasons are for keeping his mouth shut. I think Benny Hayes belongs behind bars. Well, he'll be taking a little trip up the river. Don't you worry about that. That bust that Detective Saxon made for possession was a good one. And when the case comes to trial, I am pushing for the maximum penalty. Oh, I hope you can get a couple of years out of that one. We aim to please. I still think we ought to try to make him testify. Now, he might have been killed. What's going to happen the next time Benny Hayes decides to stick his hand in the cash register? Well, don't you think I pointed that out to Mr. Hayes? But we're beating a dead horse there. The man is not going to change his story. Oh, the old man's a first-class fool. Uh, this case, this... This thing makes me feel so old. When I was growing up, it was just unthinkable not to respect you folks. Sometimes I think I learned my first lessons about law and order over my dad's knee. Huh. Tough old man, huh? Not tough, strict. I can't think of a time when I didn't really get what I deserved. The punishment always seemed to fit. Well, you were lucky. How did we get under that? Come in. Got here as soon as I could, Chief. I assume you know Mr. Swift? Yeah, hi, Lenny. Don't oh, get up. How are you? Before we get down to business, I would like to thank you for what you did this evening, Chief. If it hadn't been for you, if you hadn't acted so quickly, I don't know where I'd be. Well, what could I do? One of my officers in trouble. Besides, I wouldn't like it to get around that one of my detectives was taken advantage of right here in headquarters, with her own gun, no less. That's not the kind of image I want this department to project. I'll be more careful in the future. You can count on it. Well, I'm going to. I uh, assume that since Logan's here, you want to go over the Benny Hayes case? No, we finished talking about that. That was a good caller you made, Deborah. <laughs> in case you didn't know it, Chief. Officer Saxon is one of the best officers you have on your force. No, really? Could have fooled me. In fact, that's what I want to talk to you about, Detective. Well, since you and I have finished talking about our business, I guess I'll be leaving. If you'll excuse me? Sure. Thank you. Look, I already apologized to you about that mistake. A mistake that might have gotten you and possibly other people around here killed or injured. Now, I know you've told me you've been having problems lately. Yes, I have been having problems lately. I'm taking care of them. They're, Not they're... on my time, you won't. What does that mean? That means your record for the past few weeks has been absolutely rotten. Lateness when you do show up. Your arrests are way down. All right, I'm going to take care and make sure that I don't do it anymore. No. That Stokes case was the last straw. Now, I don't know what your problems have been, but in your frame of mind, I feel that you are a danger to yourself as well as your fellow officers. I cannot accept that. Well, what do you want me to do? 
You're going to take a little time off. Well, Chief, I would really rather not do that. I'm not asking you, Detective. I'm telling you. You are suspended for two weeks. What? I expect to see you back at your desk after that time, prepared to do the job that you keep telling me that you're capable of doing. That will be all, Detective. That will be all. Thank you. Yes, sir. By the time you read this, I won't be around. But I want to be a fond memory for you, Brian, and for Owen, too. So please, kid, don't hate me for what I did or for my wanting the truth to come out now. I just want you to remember me as family. Goodbye, son. Your loving father, Eddie. Side to look at the stars and then came home. What's the suitcase for? Oh, I was planning on leaving for LA tonight. Without saying goodbye? Uh, maybe you're right. I, I don't know if I can look at you and say goodbye without crying. Paige, no. I've changed my mind. I'm not going. Why? I thought you wanted to try to be a director. LA's the place to go. No. You know that wasn't the real reason. Well, I can't say I'm sorry you changed your mind, but you were the one that decided it was best to put distance between us. Yes, yes. I, I thought it was a good idea that we didn't see each other anymore, that it might make it easier for both of us. Well, do, do you feel differently now? Paige, I never want to be apart from you again as long as I live. I love you. Brian, I never thought I'd hear those words again, especially not now. Well, you, you better get used to hearing them. Have you d decided that you're not going to pay attention to the fact that we're brother and sister? Paige, we don't have to pay attention to it anymore. It's not the truth. Brian, what are you saying? This was all a lie, a deception. 25 years ago, my mother lied to your father. I don't understand you. All right. When Nola told Owen that she was pregnant, she was carrying Eddie Vaughn's child. Paige, Eddie Vaughn was my father. What? Nola wanted to make Owen feel that he had some kind of obligation to her, so that if their marriages broke up, Owen would do the right thing and marry my mother. Well, who told you this? Eddie did. Eddie told Paige, I just learned myself less than an hour ago. Eddie's lawyer was by, and, and she dropped off his will. And this letter, the truth is all right there. I don't know how else to say it, Brian, except straight and simple. I'm your father. Your real father. Oh, God. You're not my brother. And you're not my sister, Paige. But you are the woman that I love. No! <laughs> dropped a quarter. I was looking for it. Yeah? Well, how'd you get in here? Helen Grimble for me, and I just delivered some flowers to her. Oh, I see. Delivering flowers with a couple of ounces of grass around the stems, huh? <laughs> what are you hassling me for? Look, huh? I know you've been doing business here, Benny. Look, I keep trying to tell you, cop. I deliver flowers for a living. You, and know? you deal dope for fun. Is that it? Empty your pockets. Empty your pockets! You got a search warrant? I don't need a search warrant. I'm interrogating a trespasser. Yeah, what if I say no? Why would you, unless you've got something to hide? Well, I just like my privacy, you might. I'm telling you, 
You can empty your pockets here or at headquarters. I don't care where you do it. Come on. The other one. What's that? Aspirin. I get pains from nuisances like you. Aspirin, my foot. Pick it up. Pick it up! Oh! Oh, God! Damn! 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 Oh, my God! Oh! You all right? Yes, I'm all right. Look, are you hurt? You want me to call the doctor? Oh, no. the, the police. Shall I call I the police? I am the police! Oh, come on. Go! Deborah, come on. Just relax. Just relax. Oh, That's God. it. Come on. Just sit down and tell me what Chief happened. He was right. He was absolutely right. About what? Telling me that I couldn't do my damn job, so he suspended me. You're kidding me. It's for two weeks. He said he's going to give me that much time to shape up. Oh, come on, Deb, I think you're a terrific police officer. Obviously, he doesn't think so. Hey. He told me. What? What? I think he thinks that women aren't capable of doing their jobs. Oh, I... Owen. What? Do you realize that this is the second time tonight that somebody has had to come to my rescue? Oh, God. Come on, Deborah. Maybe the chief is right, you know? Maybe a forced vacation will do, will do you some good. Oh, the way I feel right now, I don't even feel like thinking about I know, work. I know, I know. But well, look, any ideas how you plan to spend that time? I really haven't had time to think about it. Are you open to suggestions? Sure, why not? Well, I think it's a good idea if you get away from your professional problems and out of the cold weather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought it would be a good idea if you went somewhere, <laughs> somewhere where it was nice and warm, huh? Somewhere where you could just hang out on a beach, you know, under the sheltering palms. What do you think? Take a trip, huh? Yeah. Maybe to the Caribbean. Well, I hear that the weather's real nice out in California at this time of year. Owen. Oh, oh, come no. on, Deborah. It'd be incredible. Oh. You and I out in Los Angeles for a couple of weeks. Do you know what you're saying? Yeah. You are gonna be out in California with Nola. Oh. It's been hard enough sneaking around behind her back here. I don't even know Los Angeles. Uh, Deborah. I guess I never told you. Listen, uh, Nola and I are, are through. Believe me, I have very good reasons for feeling the way I do. Yeah, my marriage is over. And oh, Deborah, I want you to come with me. What do you say? 